It's an arms race to the top. The goal is to get into the top ten. The tenth largest defence exporter in the world. We're going to be adding to the global arms race. More exports. Exporting weapons that are going to maim and kill and so on. $200 billion over the next ten years. A mass exporter of violence. It is a logical extension. A mass exporter of death. More exports. It is a logical extension. I would never have dreamed what, what goes on actually goes on. Welcome again to Get Your Armies Off Our Bodies, a podcast by Wage Peace. I'm Zelda and I'm really glad you could join us. War is big business. And in this episode, we want to look a little at how that business works in Australia, how it's changing and what that might mean. I still manage to be shocked by the extent of how bad it is. I think it's bad and that's why I start looking at it and then it's always worse than I think. Please meet Michelle Fay, independent researcher and journalist. If you're looking for detail on the revolving door between the weapons industry, our politicians, military and civil service... Michelle's work is a great place to start. We're talking ethics and corruption in the weapons business. And isn't that the question? How bad does it get? (laughs) I didn't think we're the sort of country that would um, obfuscate and lie about our funding of weaponry for this, that and the other. Not the, the extent to which I'm aware of now. For months now, the AUKUS pact between Australia, the US and the UK has grabbed mainstream media headlines. We've just heard how the nuclear submarines part has an initial budget of $368 billion. Who knows how high that will end up? And submarines is just one part of the pact. It's a weapons industry bonanza, and it started well before AUKUS. What kind of bonanza? How about we start from what we already know about the ways this business works? It is uh, an industry hardwired for corruption because um, all the things that um, make corruption possible are built in. (laughs) So so, um, for starters, there's truckloads of money and we're talking about high value, very complex deals. Um, The deals are done at the top levels of countries, so the top politicians with multinational huge corporations, um, secrecies there for national security. Defence goods are really um, complicated. You don't just buy things off the shelf, as people probably pay, may notice, that we always have to adapt and change things to suit Australian circumstances. Well, th- th- those sorts of things then make... Uh, I'm not saying that's why it's what happens here, but it feeds into making corruption more possible because things are more murky, it's not clear-cut, it's very easy to slide contracts and um, covert payments in that sort of environment. Bribery is the main thing that happens in the arms industry because there's only a few contracts each year, relatively speaking, in the tens of billions of dollars, the industry is highly competitive, so they've got to make sure they win them. So I think the weapons business, both globally and within countries, including Australia, is perhaps the most profound threat to the nature of our democracies. Andrew Feinstein is Executive Director of Shadow World Investigations. His 2011 book, also called The Shadow World, tracked some of the global corruption in the weapons business. So, why do I say this? Well, first of all, this industry is incredibly closely connected to governments. So the companies, even when they are private listed companies, have enormous influence within the corridors of power. Often you will see that the senior executives of some of the world's largest 
arms companies, many of which operate in Australia, have the same security clearance as our ministers of defense, of intelligence, in addition to which these executives all belong to the same class, if you will, as our politicians. And they effectively determine to a terrifying degree, not just policy on national security and defense, but economic policies, financial policies, and foreign policies. So their influence is pervasive. And, you know, I'm not here talking of some sort of conspiracy that needs to be hatched in a sort of dark, smoke-filled back room. There's no need for that. Amongst what I would describe as this ruling class, there is an implicit understanding of what is needed to reproduce their power and control. Corruption, political deals, hidden corporate influence. It takes people like Michelle Fay to really dig in and find out what's going on. Well, I say people like Michelle, but there are very, very few dedicated to painting a detailed picture of what's happening here. And even for her, this was almost an accidental vocation. I had my own business um, writing for the finance industry, funds management mostly. Um, After I did that for 16 years, I thought there's more to life than this as well. Um, I had great clients, so no complaints. But I wanted to move on and do something more for the broader community. Um, I I was doing, you know, buying vegetables (laughs) one day and... um, there were flyers on um, somebody's table and it uh, advertised this event and it was about excessive defence spending and $73 million a day and so forth. And I thought, oh, that sounds really interesting. I think I'll go to that. Met um, Sue Wareham, who's the president of Medical Association for Prevention of War. She spoke there. So did Bob Brown was speaking there. And Uh, I was moved to, I don't know why, how do these things happen in life, but I I just went up afterwards and said to her, that was really interesting. Um, I'm happy to help you out with editing or writing if you ever need it. And I didn't expect anything. But immediately she said that actually um, the editor of this document they were about to produce had just said she couldn't do it anymore. (laughs) And would I like to do that? So I thought, oh, okay. (laughs) So that's how... That's how I got into the, uh, this sort of sphere. It just felt like it really connected with me um, and I felt it was something really important to do. Um, it was really nice to work with then like-minded people, working on what I considered something to be important for the common good and it felt really good to me. It really expanded what I thought was possible for me to be doing. It's not like I'd been to any event like that ever before. So who knows why? I I don't know myself. That first document was for the Medical Association for Prevention of War. It was about the international cluster munitions ban. Cluster munitions scatter up to hundreds of tiny bombs across a wide area. They're indiscriminate and often they don't all explode meaning they can stay spread across towns and fields and cause devastating injuries for decades. Australia signed, had signed the Cluster Munitions Ban Treaty and in order to ratify a treaty, you need to put it into your own domestic legislation. So Australia was in the process of doing that in 2011 and 12. our piece of legislation made it okay to engage in acts that on their face actually violated the convention that would basically enable us to load the planes with cluster munitions, sit in the planes and do everything except drop, press the button to drop the bombs. So, you know, that that's the extent to which we were going to be facilitating their use. It was quite obvious to all concerned that uh, we were putting those loopholes in in order for us to continue operating with the United States military. It was such an eye-opener for me that um, we could, on the one hand, have worked for the treaty and, you know, say we're going to sign it and then actively undermine it and be complete hypocrites. I just found it completely unacceptable. So 
and I still do. <laughs> and it, it, it's really – and so maybe I was just naive. A lot of people said to me, of course, politicians always lie. But I actually find that a cop-out. I don't think we can sit there and accept that. Um, we're all here in Australia and we're citizens and we have to stand up and say when things aren't okay. It's a mistake to think of Australia as just a small actor in the global weapons trade. It might be surprising just how big the business is here. Australia has been a top five weapons importer for decades. Uh, So we're a very serious customer of the United States arms industry. This is according to... Um, CIPRI, which is um, a well-known international organisation based um, in Sweden, um, which measures the arms industry. They're very highly respected and relied on. In terms of our exports, um, we're in the top 20, which is significant-ish given our size. So we've always spent, well, not always, but roughly around 40, 50 a billion a year on defence. Um, in 2016, um, 195 billion was allocated to expand our capacity in weaponry and upgrade things. That was Malcolm Turnbull. Scott Morrison increased it to $270 billion expenditure on weapons and war machines. The increase by the Morrison government covered a 10 year period from 2020. But it's not just about the money. It's also about policy changes with far-reaching impacts. In 2016, the government decided to make defence industry a fundamental input to capability of our military forces. So that shifted the dynamic because it put industry inside the tent when it had been outside the tent before. That's a significant policy difference, um, a big shift. Malcolm Turnbull announced a policy in 2018 to catapult Australia into the top 10 of weapons exporters. That's also been a significant shift because it's us um, arranging our economy, doing things with the arms industry to make it possible to export weapons. This is to the advancement of industry, not necessarily even related to the defence of Australia, simply to have these companies become more economically viable themselves, make more money, make more profit, um, because they're this fundamental import to capability. When something is a fundamental input to capability, it's like saying it's essential. So therefore we have to ensure it's there and it succeeds. So, um, So we've got this conflation of the public interest with industry commercial interests. And these things, I think, need to be, you know, unpicked and kept separate. But now they're just seriously embedded and enmeshed together. Michelle Fay questions whether becoming a top 10 exporter is in fact feasible for Australia. The competition is big. But the impact of these changes is still significant. We now have official policy that elevates the profits of weapons companies to the level of a national strategic interest in its own right. One of the ways the government has promoted this is by establishing what it calls the Australian Defence Export Office to coordinate this business across all levels of government. And the Defence Export Facility, which has $3.8 billion to use as loans for weapons companies to get their sales happening. So who are these companies? The industry in Australia is completely dominated by multinational arms makers, the big ones. So um, BAE Systems, Boeing, Tullers, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Um, These companies, they're vast multinational arms corporations. They all have subsidiaries here and they hugely dominate the industry here. So when you have government talking about sovereign defence industry, they're really, they're subsidiaries of multinationals. Um, We do have some Australian companies, but they're very much smaller. Um, 
we're an outpost of the global arms making industry, basically. So as Australia massively boosts weapons making and weapons exports and brings in more and more international weapons companies, what should we expect? You are going to find that your political process with the ramping up of the role of defence and the defence sector in your politics has corrupted your political system very deeply. And if I had any money and I was a betting person, I'd put a lot of money on that now. The only thing I can't tell you is exactly when that sort of information is going to start coming out. It can be anywhere from five to 10 to 15 years after the actual corruption has been embedded and taken place. As someone who who writes about the global arms trade. What is even more disturbing is that Australia, or certainly the Australian government, has done this in a way that has ignored all of the lessons that should be and could have been learned from the disasters of the American process. So unfortunately, I think what you have coming is there are going to be revelations, and this is going to require very good investigative journalism. And because of the way that most mainstream journalism has gone, it's going to rely on very good investigative journalism by citizen journalists in Australia. In Australia, we haven't had big corruption cases. There's plenty of red flags. Um, The amount of money, they always run over budget, they always run over time, they always get adjusted uh, to make it more complicated for various quite valid reasons, I'm sure, a lot of the time, but who knows (laughs) about the rest of it. Um, Also, the length of um, defence procurement projects. Transparency International actually named Australia's lack of transparency in defence procurement as a problem um, in in its corruption index. So it's it's a known red flag and we've been pinged for it in an international document looking at defence industry corruption. You remember how when AUKUS came in, the contract with the French submarine maker got torn up? That company is called Naval Group. And they, too, really shouldn't have been here in the first place. Naval Group had been already under investigation three in three cases of submarine contracts that were corrupt. And uh, we knew that, and we still signed up with them to do our submarines. And then ju- after we signed up, they were added for a fourth one. <laughs> so... You know, <laughs> I don't know who makes these decisions, but if you are going with a known corrupt organisation, you know, they're getting investigated. Chris Douglas, who was um, with the AFP's corruption task force for 30 years, he's now a private consultant because this obviously exercised him as well. <laughs> the fact that Australia had signed a contract with a, a, a company under a, three different corruption investigations, so that obviously pushed a few buttons for Chris. <laughs> so he found out that uh, Defence actually didn't have any specific, it's called ABC, so anti-bribery and corruption, um, ABC programs in place. He, he was just could not believe it. So, um, and he's since looked at a few other contracts and they haven't got, they didn't have any specific things in place on those either. There are more than a few dirty businesses on this planet with high levels of corruption, but the weapons industry is quantitatively different. One study back in 2003 found that even though the weapons industry generates less than half of 1% of total trade, it is responsible for 40% of global corruption. This is corruption on a level that can break a country and its government wide open so that afterwards absolutely anything goes. In other words, it can be the gateway to an entirely corrupt system. I think the idea of gateway corruption is is an incredibly good one for understanding the impact of the global trade in weapons. And let me tell you a little bit about my own experience in South Africa. I was very privileged 
especially as a white South African who had only benefited from the system of apartheid in South Africa, to serve in our first democratic government under Nelson Mandela. I'd been involved with the ANC since the mid-1980s, and once the organization was unbanned, I returned to the country and found myself as a member of parliament. My responsibility in parliament was to draft a lot of the public sector financial management um, that we put in place to ensure we spent money appropriately and on what our people needed. As Nelson Mandela was retiring because he only served one term in office, which he decided on before he was even elected president, his successor, Thabo Mbeki, decided to spend 10 billion US dollars on weapons. Weapons that we had absolutely no need of and that we've barely used until this day. But weapons that cost us an enormous amount of money actually reduced our economic growth. The only reason that we entered into that arms deal was because conservatively, $350 million of bribes were paid to our defense minister, to at least two of the six other ministers, or two of the total of six ministers who made the decisions about what to buy and who to buy it from, senior executives in our state arms company, the head of the military, the head of procurement in the military, and various other assorted politicians, including our deputy president. This was at a time when South Africa had massive socioeconomic needs. We had a shortfall of two and a half million houses. So you're talking about almost 10 million people who didn't have an adequate roof over their head. We needed over a thousand new schools and teachers because apartheid education had focused only on white education. We had six million South Africans living with HIV or AIDS but we decided to, stand, to spend $10 billion on weapons. The consequence of that, just in relation to AIDS, to give you an indication, was that according to a study by Harvard University, over the next five years, the decision to buy these weapons and to refuse to provide antiretroviral drugs through our public health system led to the avoidable deaths of 365,000 South Africans over those five years. 32,000 babies a year born HIV positive because we couldn't afford mother to child transmission treatment, but we could afford $10 billion of weapons that we've never used. That corruption was, according to the editor of the leading political weekly in the country, the moment at which the ANC lost its moral compass. It was the moment at which it became acceptable to utilize the institutions of state for personal gain and for the gain of the party, the ANC, rather than for the national good. And unfortunately, it's been a downhill road ever since then. To the extent that Tabo and Berkey neutered our prosecutorial agencies our anti-corruption investigative bodies to ensure that this case wasn't properly investigated. Our parliament was turned into a rubber stamp for the executive arm of government. And it paved the way for a form of corruption under, Man under Mbeki's successor, Jacob Zuma, that we call state capture in South Africa, in which this president, together with his business allies, stole one-third of the country's GDP every year for the eight years that he was in office. Often enough, the bribes are the reason weapons are bought, not because they're needed or will even be used. And kickbacks can also be the reason they're made in the first place. Between political influence, secret offshore bank accounts, multiple shell companies... 
There are lots of reasons why corruption investigations really stick to the large weapons dealers. It's just that it's incredibly complex and it's a major commitment to try and bring a case to court. It's going to take decades. So there are some that have been pursued overseas um, and they take something like 20 years. So, you know, your your, uh, investigators and the police force or whoever's going to look into it, the federal investigators, need to be prepared for the long haul on this stuff. We'll include links in the show notes if you want to follow up on any of this a bit more. And, of course, it's not just about money. Weapons are weapons. They ultimately only have one end use. As the government boosts exports, Australia's complicity in war crimes is likely growing. We've loosened our arms export policy, so that's been an immediate effect of this. And if you want to elevate yourself up the rankings, you're going to have to sell to dictatorships that are committing human rights violations. You you just cannot get into the top ten by selling to legitimate countries for non-human rights violating deals. It's just not going to happen. So we now send weapons to Saudi Arabia, the UAE, other countries also involved in human rights violations like um, Indonesia. Um, We're also um, doing a lot of things with Israel who are known for the violations against Palestine. There's significant examples like that. I did a big piece on this and I put a lot of time into the research for it. What we've found is that whereas before Australia would never in a million years have sent weaponry to um, the Middle East and actually someone told me who was around in the 70s said not even a target for target practice would we send there. Now we export weaponry into the Middle East while the Yemen war is going on. It's an absolutely significant shift and it's happened since that change from Uh, in 2016 with the um, fundamental input capability, such and such. So it's had a very troubling impact straight away. The money is hidden, the contracts and sales are often secret. So how can we track this? A starting point is just to follow the connection between government and business, the revolving door. We usually only hear about high-profile figures like former defence ministers who leave politics and get lucrative jobs in weapons companies. But it's much, much bigger than that. It doesn't take long when you work around the arms industry and look at politics in Australia and see what goes on to notice the movement of people from public roles like defence ministers or their assistants, public servants, senior military, who move from those jobs into working for the weapons industry. This is not something I was aware of until I started doing this, and it really stands out. And it's not just the occasional politician. There's actually a lot of people. And it's really been normalised in Australia. I just decided it was necessary to start working on the fundamentals of these mechanisms Let's run through some of the people Michelle has written about. Remember, this is just a starting point to track what's going on. There's a lot of detail, and again, we'll include links to her work in the show notes. So one is Christopher Pine, who is quite well known, probably because he's the most recent. The former Defence Minister. Nine days after leaving politics, he joined the company EY Defence. His former chief of staff set up a lobbying firm before Pine even quit politics, which he then joined, and which advises defence companies. It emerged later was negotiating for his post-political life while he's still sitting in Cabinet. He's also the director or board member for several defence-related companies. David Johnston, another um, defence minister... This one joined Saab, which makes various weapons here. And he joined the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, or ASPE. And he also was made our weapons industry advocate. Um, So he's off at taxpayer expense selling Australian weapons industry while on the board of (laughs) one of them. I don't know what the rest of the industry thought of that, but conflicts abounding. 
Duncan Lewis, his final role was as the head of ASIO, um, which he did for five years, Director General of ASIO. That gave him oversight of the cybersecurity industry. Then, five months after ASIO, he joined Thales, which, among other things, is big in this military cybersecurity space. I mean, there's a case to make for people in that position that they just should not be allowed to join industry. Tony Lindsay is another example where he was very senior. He was a senior scientist in the civil service with responsibilities in Australia's defence technologies. Very privy to highly classified information. He left there, so a long weekend, left on a Friday, but the next Tuesday walked in the door running Lockheed Martin's new setup down in Victoria, just like that. Lockheed Martin being the biggest weapons company in the world. Peter Rees was um, in the, also in the Liberal government of John Howard. He was the Defence Minister. He joined Australia's then biggest contractor, Tenex Defence, now BAE Systems Australia. That was only a couple of days after leaving government. I don't know how that... He just broke the rules, basically, because it's toothless, these rules. They can't do anything about it. Um, Jim McDowell. He ran BAE Systems Australia for 10 years, and then he went and ran BAE Systems in... Saudi Arabia. Among plenty of other details, his jobs included working on BAE bids for frigates, then going straight into government and writing the shipbuilding plan. The array of conflicts of interest in that setup with him is breathtaking. When I was started piecing it all together, I was absolutely gobsmacked. I, I still am. We could go on and on and on. Defence ministers, military officers, civil servants, but for now, maybe only one more. Well, Brendan Nelson is a good example. Um, so he cuts across so many things. Again, a former defence minister, former ambassador to the European Union. And eventually came back and was appointed the director of the War Memorial. Where he massively expanded donations by weapons companies, a promotions coup by them. At the same time, he was on the board of one of the biggest companies, Thales Australia. He didn't stay with the memorial for long, though. And within a very short time, um, popped up as the president of Boeing, um, Australia, New Zealand, South Pacific. It's a very significant position, the biggest one outside of the USA, which is their headquarters. Um, I should say, none of this is illegal, so I'm not impugning these people uh, and their integrity because this is permitted in our system. So the problem is with the system. There's something going on with the system. The revolving door is a key mechanism in the weapons business. It's not exclusively theirs, of course. We see it in fossil fuels and other mining too. But there's an expression specific to war that covers this system. Military-industrial complex. With so many US weapons companies setting up shop here, along with others from the UK, France and Israel, just to name a few, and getting such huge policy priority from government. And now with the AUKUS agreement tying Australia even closer to US military systems, you might think we're on our way to a mini complex of our own. A military industrial franchise, perhaps. A part of US policy is to create client states. And, and you know, we are one. We're a very large customer of the US arms industry. So we're well established as a client nation to, to them. And, um, you know, our, our um, military, just the way uh, it's all configured now, uh, it's the word used is interoperability. So our uh, fighter jets, uh, warships with all our weapon systems, they're all fully integrated into the US military and what the US military are using. So, you know, 
basically, if we're going to get into a big war situation, we're going to have to do it with the USA because that's how our equipment works. Um, you know, we have to send it back for warranty <laughs> to the manufacturer. <laughs> we can't do it ourselves here. So we're, that's what you call a client state. If the weapons industry is in town, in some ways, we're all targets. So what are some of the ways we can understand AUKUS and the lead up to it over the last decade? Maybe one way to see it is the US military industrial complex coming on over for the profits from our welfare state. As those $368 billion submarines might just be a down payment. Again though, it's still not just about the money. But it is also corrupting political systems in moral ways. And what I mean by that is the militarist mindset, to quote C. Wright Mills, that is entrenched because of the influence and power of these companies, because of the way in which they see the the world through this military lens where everything is identified as a fear and a threat. And what they offer is the solution to that fear or threat to supposedly keep us safer. The political narrative within which the global arms trade is couched, often it allows political leaders to present themselves as the people keeping you safe from all of these dangers that they and the commercial media sell to you every day. It makes us incredibly fearful. And what do we do when we fear? We look to someone to save us. And huge surprise, the people who present themselves as our saviors are our politicians who will then justify spending billions, if not trillions of dollars on military equipment and everything that goes with it, including the corruption. Equipment that largely doesn't make us any safer whatsoever. So those threats play an incredibly important role. But what it does as well is it creates a sort of a cognitive dissonance where we become so consumed by these fears that are drummed into us that we lose sight of what is really making us less safe and poorer. Our War Stories episode looked at how the war business uses a false narrative of freedom. But there's this controlling narrative of fear as well. So the arms trade is an absolutely central part of creating the mindset that creates a passive citizenry that enables the pretense of democracy to continue largely unchallenged in our societies that are enriching a tiny minority at the expense of the vast majority and of course are doing all sorts of other things like destroying our natural environment in the process because our natural resources are only there for the extraction of profit. So. The trade plays an incredibly fundamental role in the sort of myths of the ruling classes in countries that are described as liberal democracies. It, it, it's the capture of the creative processes of how we could live, how we could live better lives. And Militarism and all its attendant evils close down the imagination and the space for creative thought and invention. And I can't think of anything that could be more retrograde to the human race. I just see myself as providing a public service because I feel like I'm doing something that needs doing to put transparency on an area that's really important. And the more of the, you know, 
drum beats of war around China and things, I just feel like it's uh, a crucial area that needs to be looked at. So that's what motivates me. You know, killing more people, having more wars. I don't find that at all inspiring. This has been Get Your Armies Off Our Bodies, the first season of Peace Pod. This episode was produced on unceded Aboriginal country on the continent known as Australia. We'd love to hear your feedback, so please do email or message us with your thoughts. Our contact details, plus all production credits and other links, are in our show notes. I'm Zelda, and we're Wage Peace, wishing you all a future of earth care, not warfare.